This is the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast, Episode 12, with Dr. Stephen Labouf, President of Valencell, and Yanni Ketunen, CEO of First Beat. The whole grand visage, as I call it, the big face of it all, is that you live your daily life with a wearable, whatever form back that you dig or whatever, but it's collecting data you generate to guide you uniquely to your lifestyle to better health. And in those use cases, now is what you're going to be seeing a lot about. Less about particular metrics, more about how the metrics we've already developed can be integrated into this great user experience. To get to the next level, well, the products need to get more meaningful. It's no longer like providing data or some parameters, but they really need to support the users in whatever they want to do. And that's going to be the next very, very interesting phase in the market. Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast for club owners, operators, and fitness professionals. I am your host, Josh Trent, and this is your number one trusted resource for the accelerating world of fitness technology. Each week, we bring you an expert interview with a global influencer at the crossroads of fitness and technology. You'll gain the insights, tools, and inspiration you need to stay connected to the pulse of what matters most for your fitness business in the age of exponential technologies. This podcast is brought to you by support from our outstanding sponsors. Brian O'Rourke and his family of companies, including Videri Ventures, Integris Advisors, Moon Mission Media, and many more. If you're looking for unmatched guidance, capital, insights, or a great speaker or facilitator, Brian and his partners are the go-to resource for your organization. To learn more, visit briankoorourke.com. We'd also like to thank the Fitness Industry Technology Council, your nonprofit resource for reliable technology information supported by forward-looking brands who are seeking to drive increased technology adoption in the fitness industry. Make a difference and join at fittechcouncil.org today. For episode 12, we're continuing our featured series live from CES 2017, bringing the top speakers and brands from Las Vegas right to your audio player. With fitness wearables, apps, and devices on the rise this year, Dr. Stephen LaBeouf, president of the technology company Valencell that powers the world's leading fitness wearables and devices, is talking with us from the floor about a flourishing segment in our industry called hearables, which are connected devices worn at the ear, typically functioning as an audio earbud, biometric monitor, and can be used as an augmented hearing device. This hearable segment is projected to have a compound growth rate over 170% in the next four years. And Dr. Stevens' insight and expertise on how this tech will impact the fitness industry will uncover the changes we're seeing in the way fit pros will collect heart rate, blood pressure, and perform health and fitness assessments, and so much more. You won't want to miss our second featured guest, Yanni Ketunen, CEO of First Beat and pioneer in physiological analytics and their applications for fitness. His vision for incorporating heart analytics with wearable technology has placed first beat at the cutting edge of the industry you'll learn about how coaches and trainers are using this first beat technology using precision hrv otherwise known as heart rate variability yanni is going to share with us how garmin is using this technology combined with virtual coaching for athletes and everyday fitness users to support well-being and superior performance by tracking much deeper than just steps and sweat. I know you're really going to enjoy this two-part interview. First up is the dynamic and fun personality of Dr. Stephen LaBeouf, president of Valencell, for an entertaining and insightful conversation. I'm here with Dr. Stephen LaBeouf, co-founder and president of Valencell. He is a wearables pioneer using biometric technology as a provider to the wearables industry that measures various parameters of bodily functions. Dr. Stephen is an industry-leading innovator with dozens of granted patents and 100-plus pending. Welcome to the show. Thank you much, Josh. Pleasure to be on your show. What is Valencell? Can you tell us for those of us that don't know about your company? Yeah, Valencell is an interesting and weird and a cool way company in the wearable space because we develop the core sensor technology that goes in the wearable devices to make them accurate enough to do the cool things that you want to do. So, for example, a lot of interesting use cases with wearable devices were developed a long time ago, but the technology wasn't accurate enough in a small enough form factor to make those use cases something consumers can enjoy. And so we focused on getting that sensor technology accurate enough for these things. And that's why a lot of what you see coming to the marketplace this year are new use cases that use the technology we invented and developed, you know, five, six, in some cases, maybe even 10 years ago. Yeah, and we're going to be on a panel together today. Tell the audience a little bit about the panel for hearables. What are hearables for people that don't know? I mean, everybody knows what wearables are. The term hearables was uh, was coined, uh, first time I ever heard it, it was coined by this dude named Nick Hunt, who's been, uh, I don't know if you know him, but he's kind of like a uh, I guess for lack of a better term, an ad hoc industry reviewer. And uh, he, he coined the term because what he liked about separating it from wearables, and I think it kind of makes sense, is that people use audio earbuds for things 
that have nothing to do with what traditional wearables are. You know, people need to use earbuds for things to hear. And so he, he thought it belonged in a separate category. He's probably right. If you look at that, that marketplace right now, hearables, the way we define hearables at Valencell is basically a connected ear-worn device. And what I mean by connected is the data that's transmitted between that ear piece and some other device is more than the music audio alone. There's other data. It might be used to make uh, uh, intuitive controls. It might be used to au- for augmented hearing. It might be used for biometric monitoring or a combination thereof, but a connected ear-worn device. And now th- those hearables, what's interesting is they're about, I, I want to say roughly off the top of my head, something like 330 million aftermarket uh, headphones in the marketplace, headphones and earbuds. Those are, you know, if you, com- uh, you consider the, the devices that are bundled, with smartphones, then it's ridiculous because that's a ton, you know, almost sure. unmeasurable. But when you look at the aftermarket, it's about 330 million, a little bit above that today. Wearables are about 100 million, roughly, give or take. So the headphone market is much larger than the wearables market. Now, inside that hearables market is a little chunk, a tiny little chunk, like a little spit that's about a million, roughly about, not even exactly yet, almost a million units this past year. And, uh, and that is growing about three to five times faster than the wearables marketplace is. The interesting part about the hearables, though, is that I think a lot of people in the industry, especially coaches and trainers, they're not necessarily using these in the gym setting, but high professional athletes are. I mean, what are some of the teams that are using these these sensors at the ear? Well, right now, the, the way it's working in training is a variety of teams are, are using the ear-worn sensors in training because what, what's happening is, um, say, for example, a player may be performing on a team in training, and the thing the coach is concerned about is the MOVA training. So they want a way to quickly communicate with them and say, hey, you know, get the hell off now. You can't go any further. And uh, there, there's some pioneers in the training side of it, not the hearing side of it, the training side of it that we aren't connected to, but, um, but one of them is called Catapult. And they've worked with companies, uh, rather uh, training, coaching and training to, to help uh, find ways to understand when people are overtraining because that's a real expensive to the coaches. Yeah. But on the audio side, combining that peanut butter and chocolate with the biometrics and the audio just makes total sense. You're not constraining the player when they're playing with some weird chest harness or anything like that. No weird foot pod that could get in the way. Just the earpieces. You know, it can serve both as the communication and the biometric monitoring. And the head is a little bit easier to measure than the wrist or any other piece in the body, right? I mean, the head can be tracked effectively for all kinds of movements. Yes. There are like three big things about the head that are pretty spiffy. One of them is you can measure things more accurately at the head region, especially the ear. And part of that's because of the motion artifacts and much less, you know, people look at me talking right now. I'm talking, I'm Cajun. So I'll move my hands around the cages in Italians. You see us in rooms, you know, we almost fly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why one of your arms is moving around. (laughs) But, uh, but, but the thing is, you know, the motion artifacts are a big issue for wearable devices. Hearables, not an issue because, you know, they fit in your ear. Another thing is the the blood flow profile in your ear is is fed by the carotid artery system. Basically what that means is right from your heart, straight from the heart, right into your ear. And so you get this real pulsatile signal. We can measure blood pressure with these earbuds. Yeah. You can't do that with the wrist-worn devices, even with our technology today. Another, So you can measure more at the ear than you could other places too. And another thing about it is people already wear earbuds when they exercise. And so, you know, that confluence of that use case of exercise and listening to music and getting your stats, it all, it all merges really nicely together. The landscape of hearables and wearables, there's old medical technology that worked great if somebody was laying on a bed. That's right, yeah. But everything changes when they're moving. I mean, when an athlete's running, how do you fit that technology into the sensor? I mean, what are the hurdles there? If you don't mind, Josh, let me give a, a different case rather than athletes, the health case, because you talked about sure, health. Yeah. So even a simpler, less motion case, is, check this out. So atrial fib monitoring, right? The way it's done today is if, if you go to a doctor and he thinks you have atrial fib, if he's a good doctor, what he'll do is he'll uh, recommend that you get some monitor you wear at home. It could be a halter monitor. It could be a patch. And what they're trying to do is measure the um, heartbeat signal to understand, okay, do you have atrial fib? See when it's happened. Get that data. They'll maybe ask you to wear it one or two weeks and see what's going on, right? Well, now let's say you want to put that in a truly wearable device, like say a wristband, for example, yeah. right? Or, or even an earpiece. Now you're trying to measure atrial fib. And people, well, then you find out, wait a second now, when they're typing, it doesn't work anymore. Why is that? Well, because we're measuring your typing rate rather than your heart rate, because right. that's the strongest signal. So, so even in, in, in health cases where the, the, or, or free living cases where you're monitoring someone from a health condition wearables, the big challenges that need to be overcome. Now, we've worked a lot to overcome those challenges, but there's still more to be, be solved, frankly. You have a really unique background. A lot of people call you the personality of this tech world. And I actually, oh, really? I, did, I did some research here. You have a cartoonist background. Man, you're right about that. I've been a freelance cartoonist. I saw my first cartoon when I was in ninth grade. The Darien Go. 
Goat Journal. Oh, right? how, how'd you know this? I did some research oh on you. How do you think that past, that curiosity, that natural curiosity for just expressing yourself has translated into the technology world? You know, I, I got to say, Josh, uh, I haven't thought too much about it, but put me on the spot right now. I think what it is, is I kind of came from a weird background. My, uh, you know, I always liked science. My mom was very methodical. She was very driven and very ambitious. My dad, a complete comical character. And I think when you combine those together, like Voltron, you got this weird robot that's like, you know, uh, a Cajun scientist. And, and yeah. you know, Cajun people, we, everything we do is about people. Our philosophy yeah. is everything's about people. Everything you do is about people. So everything that I do in science and engineering is about making people's lives better and connecting with them. So maybe that's kind of what comes out, you know. You worked for GE for a while. You left. You formed Valen Cell. I think it was 2006 or that's 2007. Right. It was late 2006. What was your genesis? I mean, was there a moment where you're working like, I don't want to work for the man anymore. I want to actually form my own company. What was the what was the piece behind that? So GE, I worked for GE for five years. Loved that company, by the way. It was a great, great startup company. I worked in the GE Global Research Center as a scientist and then moved up, was going right up the corporate ladder. But the problem was I saw where I wanted to be in, in that the process to get is, is to make the impact I wanted within GE would take me a lot longer. Yeah. And so I really just got tired of working for the man every night and day. And so I left a good job in the city and, and I left, went, to, went to Raleigh where I got my PhD from. And the reason I went there was because of all the universities connected there that I grew up with. And I had all these collaborations. I could work with professors and their students to help start something. But literally, I started the company with no idea what I would start the company on. What do you think you pulled from as far as your motivation? I mean, why are you so excited about tech? What makes you pop about technology? You know, uh, for me, it's funny. All three founders have a different answer for this. And this is one I have thought a lot about. For me, it's always making something big, positive happen. And, and, and with technology, I saw an opportunity to do that in a broader way, in, in a way maybe others couldn't. Uh, I always look for things where um, there's an opportunity to make a big thing happen. And if I don't do it, maybe nobody will. And if you go back to 2006, I mean, this is before, way before, I mean, the Apple Watch, way before sure. the, even the this iPhone. right around or the when Fitbit. Fitbit started. And so none of this stuff was even around. And here we were pioneering saying these are going to be the important problems to solve. And we were right about it. You know, and, and, and so we, we got to be at that foundational level. If we wouldn't have done the things we did, I, t- I promise you this, if we wouldn't have done the things we did in 2006, the marketplace would not be where it's at today. What's one of the biggest hurdles you think you've had to overcome as an entrepreneur? I got to say, probably one of the biggest hurdles is predicting the future for the investors. So for example, you know, it turns out I was right that hearables would be a big thing, but I thought it'd be two years ago. Now with investors, that sucks because, you know, they have timelines when they expect to get return on investment, right? And so, so uh, they're happy that I was right about this market. They wish I were better on predicting the, the speed of it. So I'd say yeah. predicting managing investors. Uh, uh, one of the things we've done in our company is we, we structured our company where we can focus on having a board that's directed to build a company strategically and at the same time get the technology done. So that's yeah. one of the big things I've learned how to do. Do you feel like trainers uh, that are on the gym floor right now or health club owners can use Valen Cell's technology or is it specifically more for someone who's making a wristwatch or a piece like that? I mean, how do you see that integrating into the fitness industry? The, right now, the way it works is we have relation, strongest relationships with the companies that are the brands that build the devices. The next relationship down we have is on one side is the manufacturers, because sometimes, you know, like for example, a company, a big brand might use someone else to manufacture it to show them how to put the technology in yeah. the wristbands or the armbands and the earbuds. On the other end is the use case development side. For example, uh, there's a company uh, in, in the marketplace today called First Beat. They've been around for long, longer than Valence Cell. Sure. They focused on how to use core technology uh, in, in the time, chest straps, because that's all it was there, to make assessments people care about, like your real fitness, your medical, medical grade, your VO2 max fitness yeah. level. Yeah. They were pioneers in this area. What we see is now we're, with the sensor side, partnering with companies like that on the user experience side uh, with the kind of this love sandwich of us and in the middle is the brand, you know, to, to, to build the device and get it out there using these use cases that these companies pioneered a while back. I like your analogies, love sandwich. That's fun. <laughs> you know, we look at this landscape in 2017. There's so many people here at CES. Is there one thing, I mean, besides Valence Cell, I know you're kind of partial to Valence Cell. Is there another type of technology that you really are interested in and you think is going to make an impact? Yeah, you know, I'm really interested in, uh, it's, and it's actually on the hearable side. Mm. I'm really interested in the augmented hearing and also the voice integration as the new uh, user input into into these devices, the new user interface. How do you make that seamless? Yeah. How do you make it to where, you know, I've got an earbud in and I could just say, oh God, you know, I forgot in, in my uh, secu or bank account, you know, right now, I forgot if I paid that bill or not, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And have it be seamless and know not to just go off when you're talking, no, I'm talking to you and that happening. Also, the confluence of combining the biometrics with that AI 
So, like, for example, if I'm talking to you, you can see about my body language if I want to talk to you, right? Yeah. The computers have no idea about this, so they might annoy the hell out of you if they're talking to you. But if they know what's going on in your, in your body, if you're stressed out, if you're ready for a message, they might speak to you more humanly. And so that kind of combination of voice user input with biometrics combined, that it really interests me, how that's going to go out. Tell the audience really quickly just what are the pieces that can be measured from the ear? You can measure pulse rate. There's some arterials there, the, right, that are very sensitive. The core technology that's really been driving this, Josh, is this optical technology. Now, it's got a fancy name. It's photoplethysmography, and I didn't even pronounce it that's right. That's fancy. They got like a, an extra syllable that I always drop off with my southern lazy lip. It's photoplethysmography, and people, you know, the, the, the founding fathers in plesmo- photoplethysmography get pissed off whenever I say this, but it's a, a technology built around photoplethysmography. It's a, we call it active signal characterization. So what you do is you shine light in the body, anywhere on the skin, you see how it comes out and it's full of noise. I mean, junk, trash. So you characterize the noise and the signal you want, you pull out the stuff you don't want. Okay. Now that technology can work on any part of the body where there's blood flow. The problem is because your body has different blood flow dynamics, it works differently in different places in the body. So you can measure heart rate at a lot of places in the body, but you can't measure blood pressure everywhere like you yeah. can in the ear. That's one of the things getting to your question there. You can't measure various types of hemodynamics. Uh, for example, things like uh, blood flow velocity, for example, because you might be measuring in the wrist, you might be me- measuring the capillaries where what you really want to measure is the arterioles or the arteries. Uh, so there are a lot of um, biometrics. You can only measure the ear. One thing you can measure the ear that you can only measure one other place in the body, which is the butthole, is, is your bo- core body temp. That's not as, as uh, consistent. Than I would think. Yeah, right? yeah, it's a little it's, harder to measure there. Depends on how you're sitting down and, you know, not everyone wants to wear a device there. So, but I mean, your core body temp, you can only measure that in a few places and the ear is one of them. What should trainers and club operators kind of be on the lookout from Valen Cell for in the next 12 months? Be looking for a few things. One of them is some reports on health products, health oriented products, one of the ear. I'm, I got to say, I'm actually surprised that most of the inbounds we get for health wearables are focused on the ear, even though we, we make senses all over the body. Yeah. Uh, another thing to be looking out for is new use cases that uh, use our technology. We've uh, partnered with some companies, which you know, you'll find out as time goes on, to help make better user experiences for people, which you really want. I mean, the, the whole grand visage, as I call it, the big face of it all, is that you live your daily life with a wearable, whatever form factor you dig or whatever, but it's collecting data you generate to guide you uniquely to your lifestyle to better health. And in those use cases now is what you're going to be seeing a lot about. Less about particular metrics, more about how the metrics we've already developed can be integrated into this great user experience. What a lot of club operators and trainers are trying to figure out is how do I put meaning behind the data? What do you think about combining technology and humanity together? What's holding people back from that? I think that uh, one of the things is that the use case validation is often not done well. And here's what I mean. Let's go back to the atrial fib example I gave you before, right? That's probably the, the most, uh, the easiest to outline here. If I want to understand whether or not you have atrial fib, um, and I want to prove that out and make that a, a, a user experience you dig. Well, if I'm a doctor, like you were saying before, I'm, I'm used to, I sit you down in a chair, I put some electrodes on you and I measure you, right? And that's the experience. So a company that's making something like that, all they have to worry about is, is it going to work when a doctor puts an audit? You know, this guy who's making God knows how many hundreds of dollars an hour. Yeah. In, in the consumer case, you know, it's, it's the opposite. People uh, are thinking about this innovation, boom, 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 hurry up, get the user experience out, test it. Well, it doesn't work like that in, in, in health. It doesn't work like that in sports. Yeah. And so what happens is people People don't test out the full use case first. And so one of the things that needs to be done is companies need to work together to test out with these new, these new wearables that actually measure stuff good enough now. Test these out with older use cases that were developed for chest straps, but people just didn't want to wear them, right? And test those out in, in the real setting to see where the hiccups are so that it's seamless. Because uh, right now, that really, I don't feel that's really quite happened. You know, it's kind of like tech guys, hurry, 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 put it out there, get it out there. And the guys in the gym using it, Bluetooth cuts out. I mean, something simple right. like that, you know, right. they, uh, or the sensor doesn't work whenever I'm doing wrist exercises because, you know, I've got, a, I don't have an accurate heart rate monitor on my wrist. One of the things, and this will be our last question here on like the Fitbit, I ha- I'm wearing the, uh, the Blaze. And so it has this optical sensor on the back, but yet when I've worked out and I test it with the Skosh monitor, it's 10 beats off a minute yeah. during hard exercise. So how do we get that to tighten up as far as like during exercise? How can we make these heart rate monitors more accurate? One of the things is it's uh, companies have tried to do what we do. And the, the problem is the discipline it takes to get it to work is, is more than simply a few algorithms and a few pieces of hardware. Yeah. It's, it's, it's understanding 
the the whole system and the validation aspect of it. And I think uh, a lot of companies are now moving to us after they maybe tried before to try and do this on their own and said, you know, this kind of sucks. Uh, can, can you fix our problem? And in some companies that are like uh, trailblazing or, or very well-known brands said, you know, what, I'm not going to screw up and use somebody else. I'm going to use Valence. A good example is Sunto. You know, as Sunto announced today using our technology and their products. And, you know, those guys don't mess around. They only like to use the best around. And they're never going to let me down. <laughs> I almost want to do like a drum hit right now for that. Well, thank you so much for being on the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. Is there anything else we should know about you that most people won't ask you here at CES? Something fun or interesting about you? Well, I got to say, if there's one thing that I'd love people to know is that what gets me most excited than anything else in the world is oysters. I do not know why. You know, my wife feels second place to it's oysters. It's got to be the zinc. I, zinc I, I, I must, be, must be. And also, you know, being Cajun or something like that, if I see an oyster around, I've got to eat it. And, and it's like, you know, I can't do anything about it. Like, I'm going to have to eat that oyster. So if you really, really want to distract me, just lay some oysters out, especially if they're raw and especially if they're nice and salty and savory. <laughs> I appreciate the personality that you bring to this industry that can sometimes be a little tight. And I think you do a lot to open it up. Also with some serious expertise. So thank you for what you do. Thank you much, Josh. I'm here with Yanni Ketunen, a PhD. He's the CEO of First Beat and pioneer in physiological analytics and their application. His vision for incorporating heartbeat analytics and wearable technology has placed First Beat at the cutting edge of the industry. Yanni, welcome to the show. Thank you. You know, one of the things that's come up a lot in the fitness industry is everyone knows about heart rate monitoring, right? It's been going on since probably 60 years ago or more. And we know about Polar, we know about different brands, but what would you say that is the real differentiator about First Beat? Yes, what we do is we analyze heartbeat data into different pieces. So at any given time, there's, let's say, 15 to 20 different processes in our body that influence our heart rate. They have traces, reactions in our uh, in our heart rate, heartbeat, heart rate variability. We detect those, and then out of that, we decompose a model of the physiology itself. There we can track respiration, for example, from the changes that respiration influences in heart rate variability. We, we model oxygen consumption system. Uh, we model autonomic nervous system for stress and recovery. So basically it goes way beyond the heart rate. And we, we, we only use heartbeat data and heart rate variability as the source, source of the signal to get the window to the body. But then we go way beyond. And once we know what's happening in the body, once we have a good understanding of what's happening in the body, we can provide much more actionable, insightful, and more, more individual feedback for you, whether it's for stress, training, fitness level, uh, or sleep recovery. And your background, you know, 1999, you have a PhD from the University of Helsinki in methodological and empirical advances in quantitative analysis of spontaneous responses in psychophysiological time series. What does that actually mean? <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> Glad that you find out that. So the PhD work was was uh, how to model heart rate variability, how to model stress in real life complex situations where, 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 where whereas in the laboratory you can control everything or, or or at least you try to control a lot of things, but, but it's a different world outside there in real life. And that yeah. was the sort of opening of this new paradigm that, that we, are, we, we can analyze things in, in real life. No matter what you're doing, we get a sense of what's happening in your body. First Beat is very deep in the history of heart rate variability. So lots of tools to achieve well-being, uh, superior performance at work, top sports and personal fitness. But for people that don't know anything about heart rate variability, explain what that is to a fitness consumer or to a fitness coach. So basically, there's, there's a variance between the consecutive beats, heartbeats, that changes. Basically, our heart rate changes all the time. If there's a, not a lot of variance in the respiratory frequency, that's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, that's a poor condition for the body, and that means a little bit more stress, for example. So, so basically, you would like to see some variability there, even during resting conditions. We do use heart rate variability to get a direct view into the parasympathetic vagal system which uh, is related, strongly related to recovery of anti-stressed recovery of the body. And I think people have heard of the rest and digest branch or the fight or flight, the sympathetic, parasympathetic. You have a deep background in that. Can you explain to people what happens when we tense up in the nervous system? Yes. So so basically, when we tense up, the uh, fight reaction that was originally developed to really to, uh, you know, fight or flight. We're running on very old software as humans, aren't we? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, in nowadays, we may, for example, need to prepare for, uh, for some job presentation, for example, or maybe when it traffic and evolutionary it's a good reaction to have this fight or flight but it's it may not be very good 
way to react in in daily life in a, in our normal life and basically it means that your heart rate variability gets lower your heart rate gets uh, higher there's uh, stress uh, hormonal responses in your in your body and uh, all, all of these effectively they they can uh, reduce uh, your capacity to recover which is very important but uh, one thing about stress though it's not uh, it's not really about the stress it's about the balance it's okay to have stress and it's okay right. you need to have some stress to have good performance but if you have stress all the time then it's going to get bad and uh, and, then, and then then you are at, at the risk of uh, chronic stress at the risk of, risk of in sports in overtraining or or burnout i was at an ancestral health symposium and there was a physician who was using hrv to quantify results of obesity and why people lose and gain weight mm. what are some other things that people coaches health professionals can pull from heart rate variability besides just if they're stressed or not are there tangible ways that you can coach someone along the process with hrv yes yes there are so 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 basically we have provided technology for example for some of the Garmin devices, which uh, provides a readiness score before you go for training. So basically, it assesses the stress situation in your body. And if the body is stressed for whatever reasons, it may be the earlier exercise, it may be it's a bad recovery. If your body is under stress before you go to work out, it may not be a good idea to, to flat out yeah. then, but really to do something recovery training, training because your body is not capable of uh, benefiting. Can you tell us about the research that you did? It was the year 2000 and you had some research that you were doing. I think it was around four months time for the Olympics. Yes. So, so actually, so, so we do research all the time and we have a staff of about 90, 90 today and we have uh, 20 exercise physiologists alone doing research. So, so, so we have been doing research in this area for about 20 years, 20 years. And uh, basically if products in this area, if they are not based in science, in research, they, it's not only that they can be very false, but it's, they will not work either. So laboratory is very integral to what we do, what we do, and, uh, and that, that's an ongoing process. And because it, it's, uh, you know, getting better every step, making more robustness on the, on the technology, making it more applicable to different use cases. So that's, uh, that's like in a, a everyday practice. We did start from um, uh, Olympic athletes because in the early days of wearables, in uh, in 2000 so when, when it was not called wearables so yeah so the athletes were the among the first ones to really apply this technology to to uh, win because of course if you can gain one person or half a person uh improvement it in some, some gold medal or not. Ex exactly that can be the change change so, so it's, uh, it all started from the olympic athletes but then we started applying this for normal people for working conditions and and stepwise to the more, more of the fitness uh fitness community and there's 70 different products that you have in the suite and you actually brought one today tell us about the product that you brought today Yes, so um, I have two products actually. So here's a one, one Garmin Phoenix. This shows my VO2 max. Automatically assesses your, your VO2 max if you do running, for example, jogging. Jogging and there's a new product there called Phoenix 5, which was announced just two, two days ago. It shows your training condition, training status. Which model are you wearing? This is uh, Phoenix 3, so it's the earlier model. It's not yet in a production to anyone. And um, this is a Chapra Elite Sport, very nice product. Uh, this is more for geared towards fitness. This is your heart rate from your ear. And the first time you will use it, it will make an assessment of your fitness level. Based on that fitness level assessment, it can recommend you training, training that is fit for your, your, your own level. And it provides you adaptive coaching advice based on, based on your progress and actual, actual data. And once you progress in your fitness, it will show that. We're seeing a lot of talk about hearables at CES. Mm. What do you think is the difficulty in fitting that advanced technology in these small spaces? I mean, what have you seen? Yeah, well, uh, people differ into, uh, in the anatomy. So that, that's one thing and people are different. So, so the signals can be really, really messy messy at the, at the starting point and I, I guess that's because we get to see a lot of those signals from different different devices and different sensors and uh, and that's the, that's the challenge so so it may be easy to do it do it for one person two persons just fix it but but really to have it working for you know all of us all of us so that's that's the hard work so that's the last mile of work that that's what uh, makes the difference between the uh, good ones and the not so good ones so now we live in this age of not just professional sports being served but wellness services one of the ways that first beat serves wellness is that they have this unique heart rate variability this is what analyzes the how the body reacts to kind of a 24 cycle how does this connect the dots between lifestyle and well-being and, and what does that look like from a technology standpoint in wellness basically that technology is used to create a 24-hour profile 
of your lifestyle and it's used to understand and give you an understanding as which activities in your lifestyle improve your well-being and which um, are more detrimental into your, into your well-being. And it's mostly used in a corporate wellness settings. People get to improve their performance by really understanding what, what works for them and what doesn't work. It often comes down to very simple things like, you know, the sleep. There might be some issues with sleep. Maybe you sleep, don't sleep long enough to get a good quality recovery there. Yeah. It's also what you do before sleep and uh, all different lifestyle lifestyle thing, things. And is your body capable of uh, recovering during the daytime or is it like uh, under constant stress, which is, uh, it's okay to have stress, but but it's, it's a strength to have be able to recover once in a while. And uh, that shows that the autonomic nervous system is capable of reco- recovering. Also, if there is exercise, as there should be exercise, is it something that really benefits your health? Health and uh, and basically providing personalized advice based on based on that kind of data, and that has been proven very very effective when when the this kind of uh, very accurate measurement and analytics is combined with individual coaching. The key is to understand how how you can improve your stress, how how you can reduce your stress, and that's that's a complex situation. There are many 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 different kinds of issues in our, our, our lives. So, so basically combination of uh, sensors, analytics, and uh, coaching is a very effective way of changing behaviors. And in the middle, there's somebody who's desiring better wellness. Maybe it is a corporate setting. Maybe it's on the gym floor, whatever it is. But mm. then there's HRV coming in. There's sleep data. There's step data. How does this get all pulled in? Is that What does that look like for the consumer to receive this and make it meaningful? Uh, yes, so so that's a very uh, key question, and it depends a little bit on the uh, application area. If it's like a more of an overall overall well-being, twenty-four hour our cycle, and combining all of that those parameters, so then all of the f- feedback you really need to center in your in your lifestyle and in the twenty-four hour our cycle. So it depends uh, a lot on the actual target there, and uh, and also for some some people, it be, the health may be the uh, the ultimate motivation there. Mm-hmm. Which is excellent, and then that's a little bit different from if it's let's say even like a, let's say business performance. That's a little bit different. Uh, optimizing your performance, even if in big business, so that's a little bit different goal. Goal there. So what I'm hearing from you is it's really about the unique whatever device, and then the environment that these people are measuring in. That's really what decides how they're going to receive that information, yes, and what meaning they're going to make from it. In 15 years, you have probably seen a lot of growth. What would you say, looking back, was one of the hurdles you've overcome in launching First Beat 15 years ago or more, correct? Yes, that's correct. So um, I think that, I mean, um, we need to have sensors, obviously. We have to have sensor data. And now that we see a lot of, uh, of developments in the sensor side, so that's, uh, and giving access to the physiological data we need. So that's that's one of the key ingredients in, in, in getting to market. And uh, and uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, wellness trends going on and there's more awareness in the market. Uh, but now it's really, really interesting situation because to get to the next level, the products need to get more meaningful and they need to get closer to the consumer and their actual targets and what they have in their mind, what they want to do. It's no longer like providing data or some parameters, but they really need to support the users in whatever they want to do. And that's going to be the next very, very interesting phase in the market when the products will be actually very, very useful. You've been driving your company forward for 15 plus years. What gets you out of bed in the morning? I mean, why do you love what you do and why do you love tech? Well, uh, basically, we know that we can make a big difference for people's lives, whether whether you're an athlete, if you're a corporate employee or, or consumer. And there's a lot, a lot to be gained by understanding how our physiology reacts to different, uh, different things and how, how to improve our lives. And so, so we can make a big, big Im- impact in people's lives. And that's, that's exciting. Tell us about your work with Garmin. What do you think Garmin is doing a really good job on? Uh, yes, so uh, Garmin is doing an excellent job, for example, in the, in the performance uh, sports market. And uh, they are really, I um, think they are inventing a lot of the products in those categories and uh, being able to combine complex parameters com- in complex environments into simple user interfaces. So I think they are taking, they are one of the companies taking lead for, for, for that those particular markets. And everyone knows, I mean, Garmin is just such a global brand. They're, they have so many different products. One of the things you're talking to us today at CES, the FitTech Summit, your session is wearable enhancements. What are you talking about? And just kind of unpack that a little bit for us. Yes. So uh, there, I, I will talk about uh, fitness, fitness level and uh, uh, it sounds simple, but it's to get the fitness level automatically out in, in real life, in real world. 
And that's one of the key parameters to get into the fitness. So basically being able to personalize. And I will talk about what kind of uh, product concepts uh, can be uh, centered around that. And I will present two, two concepts there, or more than concepts, there are products in the market. So one is the Garmin, Garmin product and one is a Chapra product. And, and what, kind of, uh, what kind of user experiences can be done with uh, advanced uh, analytics of the heartbeat? What do you think is happening in the next 12 months that you're most excited about, not just with First Beat, but how technology is going to increase this human experience, enhance the human experience. Yes, because we, um, it's no longer enough if you are just measuring something and you have some data. Whatever you are doing with the wearable, it needs to provide accurate enough consistent and meaningful feedback. And it needs to be actually useful. And the whole market is starting to understand that. And there's a, it's like, a, like a basic awareness of that the, that the wearables can, can, can improve, whether, you, whether it's in professional sports, in employee or in a, you know, consumer, consumer markets. And, and now everybody is starting to agree that we need to do better. Everybody knows we need to do better to really get these, these uh, products uh, meaningful for, for larger user groups. And that's happening. And that's starting to happen in big time in the next 12 months. And that's, that's a really, really exciting phase. We saw Fitbit come out in 2007, and I think since 2007, a lot of manufacturers have been really focused on just getting devices out there, but mm -hmm. not necessarily providing the use case where it is, like you had said, creating that meaning. So yes. thank you so much for creating the meaning for people, giving them something they can actually use instead of just putting out devices. Uh, where can people learn more about what you have going on for 2017? Um, following firstbit.com com and uh, our Twitter, firstbitinfo. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for spending some time with me on the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. I want to thank our show sponsors, Brian O'Rourke and his family of companies and the Fitness Industry Technology Council. You can learn more about becoming a valued partner with FitC at fittechcouncil.org and making an impact in your business with Brian's family of companies at briankoorourke.com. Pick up a copy of Brian and his partner, Robert Dyer's recent book, The Nine Partnership Principles, A Story of Life Lessons, which is available on Amazon now. For more clarity and insights about the technology that matters for your fitness business, be sure to access your free download for the 2017 Technology Trends Report right from your phone by simply tapping on the show artwork and clicking on the link in purple. To support this podcast, if you enjoyed the show, leave us a five-star review by touching the link from your show artwork or at fittechcouncil.org forward slash review. Next week, we have another phenomenal show with an expert guest to inspire you at the crossroads of fitness and technology. So until I see you again next week, be well, have an amazing day, and go out there to connect online and offline with the people you care about most.